Welcome to Let's Talk Kashris. Today we are joined by Rabbi Sholi Klein, Kashris Administrator of Dallas Kosher. Thank you, Rabbi Klein, for joining us. My pleasure. As a veteran of, veteran of the Kashris field, you have tremendous experience, and we'd like to tap into that experience today and give our viewers a very special taste of what it's like to be a Rabbi Machshir, to be a Moshkiach, and then we'll get to the consumer side, what it's like to be a consumer, and you'll shed light on that. But let's start by discussing when you walk into an event, whether as the Rabbi Machshir, whether as the Moshkiach, and you could address both, what are the first things? Give, give me a checklist. What are you looking for? Okay. You know, the Mashkiach has directions and he has rules he has to follow. The caterer has rules they have to follow. And we want to make sure that everything was done properly. So if there's uh, a buffet, I would make sure that everything is marked properly. Everything is the right pattern. Everything is the right milk, flashix. Sometimes these things get mixed up. And how, how does one check that? How do you ensure that, let's say, the chafing dishes are all fleshiks or all milchiks? Yeah, it's a good question. So generally, there are different patterns. And most caterers, if they have milchiks on a fleshik setup, the milchik will be, say, round, and the fleshiks will be rectangle yeah. or oval. Or they're both square or rectangle, but they're different styles. So if you see a mixed chafing dishes and mixed style or patterns, I would ask a question. Interesting. So you already know when you walk in, your eye probably picks up right away if there's anything added or ordinary. Right. And in addition, the, the kalim are generally marked with um, the little blue dot or a red dot. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's on a buffet. On a buffet table, the silver with the serving pieces are down. And underneath it might be the little red dot or the blue dots. Mm -hmm. I would actually go around on turning over all the, the serving pieces to make sure it's, it's marked properly or it's the same pattern because a caterer for sure would have different patterns if it's milk or fleshings. I've heard from Rab Rabbanu Machshirim that one of their big concerns when they go to supervise an event, especially with high-end chefs, certain chefs like to bring their own knives, they like to bring their own ingredients. Talk about that. How, how does someone like you, you're coming in for the first time on this event, how do you really know to distinguish between the acceptable items between items that a chef or a waiter or someone else in the serving party may have brought? A very good question. It's, it's difficult. Um, many times the, a, a chef would have right in his coat pocket would have a paring knife or a couple of knives or a thermometer or things, right, right, which of course is trafe. If they would take that thermometer and stick it in, this is really in the kitchen, they would stick it into the piece of meat to see if it's ready, uh, they would actually make the piece of meat trafe. So that's really important that the right equipment and tools are made available to a chef working in a kitchen. But even that's back of the house. So now we're going to front of the house, it's the same thing. He has his, his favorite knife that he would, would come with him. Um, if it's someone who's working at the hotel or at the caterer or for the caterer, then he probably has kosher knives. But many times you're going to an event that's at a, a venue or at a hotel, and the people working front of the house are not caterer employees. They're hotel employees, mm -hmm. or they're outsourced, and they bring in people to run a uh, buffet or run a meat carving station. And these people have their own favorite knives. They have their own favorite carving knives. And they don't tell you about it until you're actually at the event. And all of a sudden, they're unwrapping their, their, uh, their, uh, their steel, their knife, their, their special carving knives, their fork, and they sit there and they, do, they, have a, they have expensive knives. And you don't find out about it until the event. So that's right, you right away would go see who's working, in a, who's working in an event, see what equipment they have, and make sure uh, that either they belong to the caterer or, or the, they were kosher earlier in the day. Do you really have to be there before they come? You know, the, ideally, should a mashkiach almost be like the welcoming committee? For sure. For sure. I, I always instruct a mashkiach. They have to be there before anyone comes. If they come after the, everything is set up already, they're late to the party. Mm -hmm. They have to come. They should be there first. Or they should, if they're, if they're making sure bef before everything is unloaded, before everything is loaded onto the table, before everything is set up, they should be there. Generally speaking, we have the mashkiach should be there one hour before the event to make sure he's not being surprised. Do you have a protocol or some kind of regimen that you do with waiters or staff where you call them together, especially if they're not familiar with kosher events, and almost give them a, a primer? You know, this, this is a kosher event. This is what I, at this, as the kosher supervisor, expect, and so on and so forth. Is Absolutely. There's something called roll call. Before every event, uh, all the waiters get together for roll call. And they, um, the, the head waiter or the banquet, whoever the person is who's giving you directions, will kind of call out what's going to go on. This event is going to be uh, these kinds of a people. Don't, you know, be older people, younger people. It's going to be a party, what the event is. 
uh, what's being served, you know, kind of just to give them an, an update, because many times the people, of course, the, the people working in front of the house have no idea what the event is, if there's something they in particular need to know. Uh, and that's many times we have the opportunity to go out at that point and hop onto a chair and, you know, say, depending on, you know, the event and how many waiters there are, there could be 50 waiters, and you're going to go ahead and, and explain to them, this is a kosher event, and when the guest says, the, uh, can I please have some butter for my roll? They don't want butter, they want margarine, and they say, I want milk for my coffee. They don't want milk, they want mm -hmm. the, you know, the coffee rich, and so you have to be very careful when the guest asks a certain, a certain uh, ingredient, they want the ingredient that's made available to them to represent and to mimic the thing that they're asking for. And this is very confusing to a waiter because they, they're, tr they're trained and they're told, you bring the guests, whatever they're looking for, whatever they're asking for, you make sure you, you take care of the guests. And now we're saying, not really, it depends. <laughs> it depends what they, what they want. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to come uh, and ask you know, for, for any, special, any special request. You need to ask. The mashkiach always needs to be there, it needs to be available, it needs to be front and center, it needs to be visible to the guests, it needs, it needs to be visible to the workers. And I always train the mashkiach, if the waiter is coming and asking you, where does he get a lemon? You know, someone wants lemon for their tea or for their fish. You don't see lemon. I don't know, whatever, who cares, it's kosher, Le all lemons are kosher. Well, if you do that, right, and don't help them find their lemon, they're not going to come ask you for the ketchup, and they're not going to come ask mm -hmm. you for the milk and for the cream, and for anything else they're going to be asked for. So you make sure you're helpful, you're there, That's they feel true. you're part of their team, you're not the enemy, you're not an adversary, because yeah. if they feel you're the enemy, they're going to hide things from you. And then no one, then no one benefits. That's very interesting. So there's, there's almost a psychological side of being a mashkiach. It's not just about supervising. It's not just about the X's and O's. It's really about having a relationship Absolutely. with the workers. So that, like you said, you have a good rapport with them. You're on their team. You're their ally. If they need help, you're going to be there for them. And then, like you said, there's a better chance that they're going to come to you for help. So I think that's, that's really fascinating to, to hear. Now, I imagine... And, and many yeah. times... Um, it's for a new mashkichim, it's so strange for them because they're like, no, I'm the mashkiach. You know, mm -hmm. I'm just making sure that it's kosher. And I, none, I don't really care about all those other things. I just need to make sure that they're kosher. Well, if they look at you at that guy who's like their supervisor but doesn't really care and doesn't, is not there for their success and doesn't care about their success, then they're not going to care about you. And they're not going to care about all of your rules and instructions because you're just that guy who's telling you what to do. But if they feel you're their supervisor but cares about the execution of the program and cares about them being successful and the guests being happy, then they care about what you have to say. Have you, could any story come to mind where because of your rapport with the waiters or the staff that they really actually came to your aid as far as the kasha supervision is concerned? First of all, all the time. I mean, the fact that they come and ask for milk and, and, and where do we get the milk from, if, this is at a, if it's at a venue or a kosher place, then that's not a problem. But if you're at a hotel, many times there's a function at a hotel. And although there is a place where the coffee rich is, you know, the non-dairy creamer, there's also places in the hotel, I don't know where, where there's milk, right? Mm -hmm. And butter and, and ranch dressing. And there's places somewhere. So if the waiter, it's easy for him to go running around looking for milk rather than asking the mashiach for directions, then yeah, he'll go find things. Even if you think that you move them from the regular place, but it's still there at the hotel. Mm -hmm. I've had, many times, we have had other waiters tattletale on other waiters. They'll pull me up and go, Rabbi, I know I shouldn't be saying this, but you know, so-and-so, I don't know, he's got some stuff, check under his table, you know? Really? Oh, all the time. Wow. It's a very, when you have a good relationship with a, with a team of waiters, more in, like in Pesach hotels, uh, that's a whole other story. Because um, that's a 10-day you know, event, and you're really getting a relationship with sure. uh, all the waiters. And, and the pressure there is probably immense, right? Right, because, the, because they themselves have to run to the kitchen. All the guests are having special requests, so they, they anticipate what the guest is going to need, mm. and they save it. So if the guest is asking for you know, uh, certain kinds of a condiment, they'll save the condiment. So that they, when the next meal comes, the condiments are ready. Well, that's usually fine if it's you know, ketchup. Oh. But what if it's butter or milk? Or, or a dairy, or, 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 uh, or knives, or certain uh, pieces of cutlery, or, or plates. So they save, they'll save stacks of plates. Without realizing the ramifications. No, because they're just saving plates. Right. And they're stacking it under the table. So there's a side table with a tablecloth. You know, you always pick up. Mm -hmm. At the Rava as Mashkik, we always pick up the tablecloths, and we find all kinds of things under really? the tablecloths. Yeah, one time, 
Oh my gosh, I shouldn't say this on video. One time we found a sandwich on Pesach. We found uh, a sandwich under the table. Um, the waiter had stored it for himself? Yeah, yeah. they brought it. The, the waiters work very hard, you know. So they brought it in from whatever hotel he was staying at. They brought it in. It was a half-eaten, you know, tuna fish sandwich on whole wheat bread. I still remember that. Um, and, and then we, like, when I we went out, whose sandwich is this? And then, like, the poor guy was speaking in Spanish, and he didn't speak. <laughs> and then the other lady, the girl who was with him, he was screaming. He goes, no, he, uh, it's his, and he bought it. And it's, I'm like... I don't care who owns it. I'm not, I'm not saying he stole the sandwich, but you can't have a whole wheat sandwich with tuna fish in the hotel for Pesa. Oh, I remember that story. But uh, under the side tables, that's where all the action is. People hide things and put things there. So we always, always check.